Hi, good morning, welcome. So, uh, those of you who haven't responded to your emails, I'm a little bit behind. Uh, I will get to it uh, today and tomorrow. Um, but just uh, one question that I would like to address. I didn't have time to get back to the person asking for permission uh, to use her name, so, um, so I won't. The question was about, remember the, um, the nun study? were the nuns who were more positive, celio pain, as an example, um, actually lived longer, significantly longer than nuns who were, um, who were less optimistic, less positive. And that was the only thing that predicted uh, long, longevity. So the question was, how do we know that it's uh, causational? How do we know that it's not just correlation? Because it could be that the healthier nuns are also happier, and therefore they live longer. And there are two responses to it. The first response is, we can't know. You know, this is a correlational study. It won't, you know, you can run regressions, but still you can't ultimately determine correlation unless you have an intervention study. And in this case, even though the nun study itself was not an intervention study with a control group, an experimental group, we do have actual studies that do show that when we intervene and when we do lead to um, a more merit finder approach, more optimistic style approach, there are actual, actually health uh, consequences. And the, the two examples I used, and we'll talk about them more in later classes, was the research by Laura King and Kathy Minor from UCLA. And the research that they did was go to um, people who have experienced traumas and had them write about their, their trauma. And they wrote about it, and these, the people who wrote about it, and they had to write specifically saying, did you learn anything from it? Are there any positives in it? Remember, not that things happen for the best, but can you make the best of things that happened? And those people who wrote about the positive aspects of trauma, quote unquote, were actually healthier as a result. Another example with cancer patients. Those who wrote about the benefits that they could see with, with having gotten cancer. Again, not that it happened for the best, but what have you learned from it about yourself, about your relationships, and so on. The people who cognitively reconstructed their cancer and found even positives there were actually healthier when measured a year later, four years later, and nine years later. So that's an example where you can actually establish causation. There was an intervention study. Some people were put in the control group. They did not rewrite their experiences in the positive. And then you had the experimental group who did rewrite the experiences. And that's how you can establish causation between being a merit finder, an optimist, and being healthy. And that's a positive sign because it shows that regardless of where your base level is, what your natural inclination is, if there is an intervention, you can actually change your interpretation style. And that's important because we are very much about change. If, if you were just born with a certain level of optimism or pessimism, then you, know, you just resign yourself to that. And what we're going to talk about today in the second half of the lecture, we're going to start talking about change and how to change. So remember last time where we ended, right? We saw we, what the media does, the media bias, that the media doesn't just reflect, but it's not a mirror, not a looking glass, but a magnifying glass. And that there is a bias toward the negative. Now, there are benefits to that, obviously, because the media directs us to places where we should do something, what we should do something about it. So it's certainly positive in that respect, but it also recreates or creates a schema in our mind that says being optimistic or being idealistic is unreal. It's detached. It's Pollyannish. It's unrealistic. And what we want to do, what we're trying to do in this course is to become realistic, i.e. to shift the pendulum more to the middle, not to go to that Pollyanni side, everything is great and wonderful in the world. That would be detached. But to recognize the fact that 
there is a lot of good in the world. And the problem, if we don't focus on it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the examples I used last time, you remember, was one of them in terms of a person reading in the newspapers that the big businesses are guilty of fraud. The schema that this person will internalize is to be successful in business, one must sometimes bend the rules. What the media doesn't report on is the millions and billions of transactions, honest transactions, taking place literally every single day, largely ignored by the media. Why? Because the media focuses on the exception that's more interesting, more exciting, not on the rule. Or the example I gave about politics. You know, that many of us wanted to, myself included, wanted to go into politics and people say, oh no, you're, you're too honest for politics. They'll eat you alive. Well, that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy if the only thing that we see are when politicians fail or when they lie, when they cheat, as opposed to the millions of politicians who are there to, to do good in the world with good intentions. And I ended last time by saying that the fact that there is so much goodness in the world, that there is, the fact that there is so much benevolence in the world is a testimony, if anything, to our natural inclination toward the good, our good nature. Because remember the, uh, the studies on priming? We have so much negative priming out there through the media mostly, but not only, that it is really a wonder that we continue to do good to such a great extent. Even here at Harvard, Debbie Cohen, teaching fellow in this class, brought me this today, um, Harvard in the community, about the activities that, that, that Harvard students and faculty do in the community, how they contribute. And it's, it's really remarkable, the kind of things here, whether it's, um, and every school does it, you know, whether it's the business school, the law school, FAS, and, and all others. And it has to do with the arts, nonprofit support, um, homelessness, uh, providing access to Harvard facilities and events, legal services, uh, youth development, education. I mean, it's remarkable. Whether it's what PBHA does, where there are over 1,800 undergrads who are members of PBHA and many others who are, who are doing great work. So there is a lot of goodness. The question is, what do we focus on? And what we focus on creates reality. Now here is the question. And this is a question that was, was raised right after class and also via email by John Passanese. And what he asked is, if we know the importance of priming, we know the importance of creating a positive schema, why isn't there more positive out, positive out there? And he continues to say rightly, and it's the positive psychologists who should be concerned about this, who should promote this, who should explain to people the importance of recreating the schema, or creating a new schema, shifting the pendulum, not toward detachment, but toward reality. And this is exactly what I want to do today, because I do think this is the role, one of the roles of positive psychology. One of the consequences, you know, the, one of the consequences of having this negative schema is not just about, you know, business out there or volunteering out there. It also very much has to do with our internal dialogue. You see, most of our, for most people, not all, but for most people, the internal dialogue usually sounds something like this. Why did I make this comment in section? I looked like such a fool when I went up to her. Why did she say no? I have so, mu so much to do. I'm not getting anything done. I'm tired. I'm stressed. This is the internal chatter that so many people have much more than the internal chatter that sounds like this. Wow, I spoke up in class today. That's courage. Wow, I made a really good connection between the reading and lecture. Wow, what a beautiful day. Well, I'm going to have dinner at Quincy tonight. That's wonderful. <laughs> Does anyone have that chatter? Rarely, right? And one of the things one of the things that recreating the schema can do is that we, do, we have more positive chatter. Because remember the power of priming. And this is what we're going to talk about now. 
how to correct the false schema, how to get a realistic evaluation of reality. First, through the news. How about starting the good news paper? The good newspaper, and there are some out there, if you, you know, I googled it and found some things, but still not mainstream, that will discuss peace, that will discuss virtues and values, that will discuss achievements, that will discuss heroic stories, that will discuss happiness, that will have column on positive psychology, that will discuss technological advances. How about that? to counter a lot, of the, a lot of the bad news that's out there, just to shift the pendulum. Art has done a lot to get us to where we are today in society. In fact, the artists during the Dark Ages transitioned us toward the Renaissance. It was they who showed us the potential that we have within and without and they led to the external revolution toward the Renaissance, but also to an internal revolution where people began to believe in themselves. The role of art. Aristotle wrote that fiction, and you can change fiction with any other form of art, fiction is more important than history because history depicts things as they were. Art depicts things as they can and ought to be. Art can show us the ideal. Once again, shift that pendulum. The great artists of the Romantic era, the 19th century, even though they were immersed in very often an oppressive society, harsh conditions, they still created an ideal. An ideal for us to aspire to. They focus on the heroic within us. They focus on the potentialities that we have. And through that, not, not ignoring the negative, not ignoring the negative, Victor Hugo certainly focused on the negative as well, but also showing that there is a way out, a romantic sense of life that these artists introduced, helping to create an internal and then an external revolution. Look at the 1930s when Hollywood really flourished. Preston Sturgis, Frank Capra, two great directors. Even though there was a lot of hardship at that time, they created movies with a positive sense of life to show people the potentialities, the potential in their lives, in their relationships, and in the world. And through that, they, sh they showed people a light at the end of the tunnel. There are many of you here who are involved in the arts. The role is much more than just uh, bringing pleasure to you and to others. It has a role in promoting society, in bringing society forward. Remember, depicting life as it can and ought to be. Whether it's through sculpture, whether it's through painting, whether it's through theater. The next week you're going to hear about a program that's starting here with exactly this um, this intention, depicting life as it can and ought to be, shifting the pendulum more toward the positive. And then, through studies. Many psychologists, some of them here, doing work on positive psychology. Hopefully, some of you will continue this Promoting the good by focusing. Remember, what we focus on very often creates our reality. There's another reason why we tend to focus on the negative. It's not just the media. It's not just that there is a lot of negative studies out there. There's another reason. And that reason has more to do with our nature than with anything external more with nature than with nurture. And that is our ability, our capacity, our inclination to adapt. 
we naturally adapt to what is prevalent. We naturally adapt to the rule. What we pay attention to is the exception. The good is the rule. The bad is the exception. And therefore, we adapt to the good and we learn to take it for granted. What we detect is whenever there is a change, something that is anomalous, it immediately catches our eyes. Why? Because this is a survival mechanism. We need to be able to recognize, oh hi, <laughs> the exception. We need to be able to recognize something which it, okay, enough for it. There. It helps us in case of danger. For instance, let's say there is a smell, a poisonous smell. We need to be able to detect a change in smell for survival. Or there is a predator walking. We need to be able to hear a change in our auditory field. Or a baby crying. We need to be able to wake up. But otherwise there is noise which is normal and we don't wake up from it. So the adapting to the normal is healthy. It's important. Imagine if you were paying attention to everything going on around you. To the person next to you, to their pen, to your pen, to what you're wearing, to this microphone, to this statue, to everything. It would go crazy. It would be overwhelming. And that's why we adapt to what remains static, what remains constant. Something that is there all the time, to the rule. And we only pay attention to the exception. Again, it, it, it is part of our need for, to survive. Also, adaptation helps us to overcome difficulties. Can you imagine going back to Gilbert's studies about the tenured professor? If the tenured prof or the non-tenured professors would remain upset and disappointed for the rest of their lives, they wouldn't adapt to the situation, which is you didn't get tenure. It would be devastating. People wouldn't survive. We'd have, I mean, depression would be at 100% because we all go through difficult periods. But we all adapt. We get over them. Back in 1997, in, on December 19th, I lost the closest person in the world to me. I was living in Singapore at the time, and Bonnie Hicks, who lived in Indonesia, came over to Singapore with Singapore Airline Flight 185. The flight crashed over Indonesia, and I lost the closest person in the world to me. When that happened, my, my world was crushed. I didn't think I would ever get over it. It happened on a Friday night. On a Saturday morning, I called Nathaniel Brandon. Nathaniel Brandon, I met him before, and he also met Bonnie. And also, Nathaniel Brandon lost his wife in a tragic accident when he was around my age. I called him up, and these were the words that he said to me. He said, Tao, this is going to hurt like hell. It's going to hurt for a while. But he, and then he said, I know you may not hear this now, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. You're going to get over it. You're going to get over it. We all do. Because if we hadn't, then God help us all. Because if we hadn't, then God help us all. Can you imagine if we hadn't gotten... We all experience loss. We all experience difficulties and hardships. No life is, uh, is, is devoid of that. But we get over these things. And I got over it and it took time. But now I'm able to think about Bonnie and to smile. Wistfully. Sadly... But I've assimilated, I've internalized this emotion. What Nathaniel Brandon said, fortunately, is correct. We do get over, we do adapt, we do get over difficult experiences. Because if we hadn't, then God help us all. So that's a good thing, that we adapt. But there is another side to it. We also adapt to the positive. And we take things for granted. 
We take the good things, the wonderful things in our lives for granted. We talked about it before, right? We take Harvard for granted after freshman week. We take dining hall food for granted during freshman week. <clears throat> we take our close relationships often for granted. Our parents, our siblings, our wonderful friends. We take these things for granted. Why? Because they're there. And they're there all the time for us. They're the rule. And we tend to focus on the exception. For good, at times, because it helps us overcome difficulties, but also, sometimes we pay a price for it. And one of the prices that we pay for it is that we stop appreciating the wonderful things that we have in our lives. So here is the question. Can we eat the cake and leave it whole? In other words, can we use this mechanism, the adaptation mechanism, to overcome difficulties? Because otherwise we would not survive. And remember, the mark of... Um, of the optimists and the happy people is not that they don't experience these downs, is that they recover much sooner than the people who are depressed. So can we overcome difficulties, but, but at the same time take things for granted? And the answer is emphatically yes. It's not easy, but it's possible. The question is how. There's a story in, in Jewish tradition about a man who lived in Eastern Europe, in one of the communities, in a shtetl, in a village. And he had a miserable life. He couldn't stop bickering and fighting with his wife. His children were constantly nagging. His house was small. He didn't have a lot of money. Um, he was miserable. And he went to the rabbi, to the village psychologist and said to him, Rabbi, help. I want to be happier. I'm miserable. You know, it's my wife, it's my kids. My business is not doing well. How can I be happier? I'm a God-fearing God man. You know, I come to, to, to the synagogue every day. What can I do? The rabbi said to him, um, do you have chickens in your backyard? The man said, yes, I do. He said, okay, take the chickens and bring them into the house. He said, Rabbi, he said, do as I say. He was a God-fearing man. He went home and brought the chickens into the house. It was a complete mess. The chickens would lay eggs, would do other things in the house. It would stink. It would be terrible. A week later, he goes back to the rabbi because the rabbi said, come back after a week. He said, rabbi, what have you done? This is terrible. It's awful. The rabbi said, do you have a cow? He said, yes, I do. Take the cow and bring it into the house for the week and come back and see me. Rabbi, what are you kidding? Are you crazy? My house is small. I just told you that. Do it. He goes home and he brings in the cow into the house. Misery to the nth degree. They can't sleep at night. Uh, the cow is, makes a mess. You know, the children are upset. The wife is bickering even more. He's upset now. He can't concentrate on his business anymore. But finally, a week goes by, and he goes back to the rabbi. And he tells the rabbi, this was terrible, awful. The rabbi stops him and says, do you have a horse? <laughs> yes, rabbi, I do have a horse. I'll take it into the house. Says, rabbi, the rabbi says, go and do as I say. He goes, brings the horse into the house. You don't want to know what happened in that household. You really don't want to know. Terrible, upset, fighting. It smells. They want to go and sleep outside, but it's too cold. They somehow make it through the week. The family is miserable. You know, Father, how can you do this to us? You know, what are you doing? And he said, look, the rabbi said, I can't. I, can't, I have to do it. He goes back to the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, I can't even tell what have you done to us. The rabbi says to him, okay, now go home and take the animals out and come back to me in a week. 
he takes all the animals out, he comes back in a week and he says to the rabbi, oh rabbi, life is wonderful, my wife and the kids are great, no one is complaining anymore, we're having a, a wonderful time, thank you so much. So the question is, I mean this happens to us every day, metaphorically. When do we start to appreciate the positive things in our lives? When there is a negative. When do we appreciate a, a great meal when we haven't eaten for a while? When do we appreciate life? when something terrible happens? When do we appreciate the fresh air, the first day of spring? When do we appreciate health, when we recover from sickness? And here is the key question. Must things get worse before we recognize how wonderful life is? And this is the question that the rabbi posed or had the person experience, and this is the question that we need to pose to ourselves. Must things get worse before we can appreciate how wonderful our life is? And again, our life is wonderful overall. Yes, there are difficult things, there are bad things. But the question is, what do we focus on? Do we take for granted the rule and focus on the exception? Or do we learn to appreciate the wonderful things in life? You see, because being grateful is the opposite of taking things for granted. When we say thank you for a meal, we're no longer taking it for granted. When, he, when we say thank you to our parents, we no longer take them for granted. When I say thank you for a meal in a house, or go to the cook in the dining hall, I'm no longer taking him or her for granted. This is the opposite. And we can learn to be grateful. We can learn gratitude as a way of life. G.K. Chesterton, British philosopher, you say grace before meals, all right. But I say grace before the concert and the opera, and grace before the play and pantomime, and grace before I open a book, and grace before sketching, painting, swimming, fencing, boxing, walking, playing, dancing, and grace before I dip the pen in the ink. Gratitude produced the most purely joyful moments that have been known to man. How true is it? I mean, think about the last time when someone said a deeply, deep felt thank you to you. I really appreciate what you did for me. Thank you for being such a good friend. Thank you for being such a good son or daughter. I'm so proud of you. How did you feel then? But you see, and the thing is about gratitude, it's a win-win. The person giving thanks and the person who receives thanks benefits from it. And we're going to talk about studies that actually quantify that. When it comes to the ultimate currency, to happiness, grat gratefulness as a way of life has an abundance of the ultimate currency. It creates the ultimate currency. So how do we become more grateful? What do we do? A lot of the work in this area, until recently, was in the realm of theology. Religion, I mean, what is prayer? Prayer is expressing gratitude. And there's research by David Myers, I mentioned him before, from Hope College, who illustrates that people who are religious generally, again, this is a correlation, are generally happier. One of the main reasons, because they constantly express gratitude. What is prayer? Prayer is gratitude. Whether it's for our daily bread, whether it's for our health, whether it's for God, whether it's for our family. And the book that David Steindl Rast wrote it's not intended just for religious people. What he wants is for people to regain their sense of awe, the sense of gratitude in the everyday. It's a wonderful book that I highly recommend. One thing that he says, why not start by surveying a typical day? What is it you tend to tackle with spontaneous mindfulness so that without an effort, your whole heart is in it? Maybe it's that first cup of coffee in the morning, the way it warms you and wakes you up or taking your dog for a walk, or giving a little child a piggyback ride. 
It is a matter of practice, of doing it over and over again, till it becomes second, second nature so gratitude becomes a way of life. It is practiced like every habit. And we're going to start talking about today, how do we make change? How do we make gratitude a habit? He continues, gratefulness is the measure of our aliveness. Are we not dead to whatever we take for granted? Surely to be numb is to be dead. Now, he's saying a few things. One of the things that he's saying is practicing it. The other thing that he's saying, and this is going to become more and more of a central theme in this class, it's taking time. It's taking time to appreciate things. Pose, running into the dining hall, running out. Well, try when you go there for lunch today. Walk in a little bit slower. Look at the ID checker. Smile at her and say thank you. Not automatically, but from here. Afterwards, go to the cook. He or she's not going to know what, what hit them today. Go to the cook <laughs> and say, thank you, your meal was wonderful. And you're going to get that for the rest of the week. Take time. And in your response paper this week, you are going to take that time. You're going to write a letter of gratitude to someone, to anyone. Someone that you, whom you feel deserves your gratitude and you haven't taken enough time to do that. It's just one letter. But I hope it's a start. Let's talk about some research. As I said earlier, it's still in its infancy. The real research in this area started after positive psychology became an official area of research, so just over the last maybe seven years. But there are some great, great studies that just came out. Let me share with you one of them, the one that you're reading for this week, Emmons and McCullough. What they did was take college students, they later replicated it, by the way, with uh, people in the outside community, but they took students your age and they divided them randomly into four groups. These four groups were one group every night before going to bed, and by the way, I'm, I'm condensing two studies together now, you'll read them separately uh, in your readings. One group, every night before going to bed, had to write the five things for which they're grateful. Anything, little things or big things. Something that they had to eat or their parents. A flower that they saw today or their boyfriend or girlfriend. Whatever it is, at least five things for which they were grateful and to focus on it, so not just to write it mechanically, but actually to think about what they wrote, to experience it. The second group had to write at least five hassles in their lives, five bad things in their lives. The third group had to write at least five things at which they were better than others at, which they were superior to others at. And the fourth group was a control group. They just had to write five things that they experienced during the day. And they followed them for as long as six months. And they followed them on a few dimensions. Levels of happiness, optimism, how likely they were to achieve the goals that they set, how healthy they were, i.e. how many times they visited the doctor's office during that period, and how pro-socially they behaved during that period, how much they helped, how generous were they. And what they found was that the group, and this is a tiny intervention, what, like three minutes to write it before going to bed? But the group that performed worse, least happy, optimistic, least likely to help others, most likely to visit the doctor's office, and least likely to achieve their goals, was the group that wrote about five hassles in their lives every day. Group two and three were tied with the same result. The group that outperformed them all was the gratitude group. People who express gratitude every night with intention before going to sleep were happier, more optimistic, more likely to achieve their goals, behaved more pro-socially, were healthier and happier. 
In other words, both psychological and physiological health benefits. What a simple intervention. What remarkable results. Other research shows the physiological benefits. What it does, for instance, is increase parasympathetic activity. In other words, able to control stress better, induce calm. It controls hypertension. People are healthier who learn to be grateful. There's also trait gratefulness. Some people more inclined toward it than others. Trait gratefulness is associated, correlated with hope, with optimism, with less likely, likelihood of depression, less resentment toward other people, less envy, more overall happiness and vitality. So the question is, the question is, how do we get it to be a trait? Yeah, we can have a state gratitude, you know, after we say thank you to someone or someone says to us, but how do we get it to be a trait? And the answer is through repetition. By mindfully focusing on this activity over and over again and doing it repeatedly, and we'll talk about it in the lecture on change, we can actually induce this as a trait of being more grateful by doing this exercise consistently. I do this exercise. I've been doing this exercise every single day from the 19th of September 1999. Every single day. I have a file. It's probably my biggest file on the computer that I write down things that I'm grateful for every day. Little things and big things. Important things and things that may seem trivial to others. Let me read to you. I initially put it in my notebook and then transcribe it when I transcribe. Let me read to you what I wrote yesterday as an example. God, Tamush, my love, my wife, David, adorable, my son, was playing with a clown. He had this uh, um, helium balloon clown that he was running around the whole house with it. My parents, Cabot House faculty dinner. I had a wonderful conversation with you. <laughs> um, 1508 lecture yesterday, we had a visitor, those of you who were there, Scott Snook, it was great. Um, the salmon we had for dinner, uh, whoops, uh, beep, censored, sorry. And after beep, uh, <laughs> I can't tell you everything. Um, and after uh, beep, meditation. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Can you turn down the lights a little bit right here, please? No, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, here is two days ago. Once again, every day I have um, uh, three things that I talk about regardless. It's God. It's my parents, and it's Tamush, my wife, and our baby. Four things that I talk about every single day, regardless of what else I write. I write many more things than five, usually. And by the way, I do it even when I have horrible days. It's always possible to find positive things. That doesn't mean that I ignore the negative. I have a journal, and in my journal, I often write about the difficulties that I'm going through. So I'm not saying ignoring it, but this is there every single day. So on the, 20, on the 28th, God, um, prosdor talk, I gave a talk uh, where I gave an, an improv, the PowerPoint didn't work, and, but it turned out okay. Happens often uh, lately. Uh, 1504, uh, I had a fun lecture. Uh, students' meetings, I had office hours. Uh, Charles Jacobs' meetings, his dear friend, parents, Tamush, so wonderful, David, adorable, uh, beep, beep, uh, beep. <laughs> now I told you there are only four things that I write every day. That's not one of them, but <laughs> but, but it's okay. <laughs> you know, when you don't have something, you appreciate it more. But <laughs> kidding, kidding. 
not good advice. Don't listen to it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I was also I also wrote great gratitude for my teaching staff. They had teaching fellows, you know, Jeff, Jess, Sean, who worked so hard, way beyond, way beyond the call of duty, and the rest of the teaching staff who are doing amazing, amazing work, so committed to the success of this course, so committed to you that I'm grateful for. I'm also grateful, and I wrote this, to Barry Reed, who's sitting in the back making sure that everything happens, everything ticks, not easy. I also wrote thank you to Megan Buckingham, who's there with the camera, again, behind the scenes, but making sure that you can not attend lecture and watch it <laughs> online. So, I do this every day. It's a habit now. It's simple, and it makes a huge difference. I want to start forming a habit now, for those of you who are not doing it. And what I want you to do is to take just two minutes to write down things for which you're grateful in your notebook. Things, big things or small things, whether it's a meal or a beep, whatever it is. Okay, two more things. Okay. I wonder what you wrote. So, what I want you to do in a minute is to turn to the person next to you and share some of these things. Are there any parents here? Just I know it's no, I know it's junior parents. Is it junior parents weekend? Yeah, are there any parents here who are visiting? All right, so if your parent is here, do it with your parent. Uh, you may have to censor a few things with the parents, but <laughs> um, turn to the person next to you and share. Don't, you don't need to share everything, obviously, but share some of the things for which you're grateful.
If you haven't switched, switch. If you haven't switched, switch. Okay. All right. Now, does anyone want to share? <laughs> does anyone want to share? Just throw out things for which you're grateful. Big things, little things, anything. Music. Sorry? Dogs. Ice cream. Sanders, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> What's that? Shh. I can't hear. Red spice chicken. Okay. Yeah. What else? Positive psych. The shuttle. Thank God for the shuttle. Yeah. What? Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, from the back, sorry, yeah, why not? <laughs> okay, so, all right, so, so I think we've established that there is a thing or two to be grateful for. Do it. Just do it. You can't make a change in theory. You can't enjoy change by attending a lecture. It doesn't take long. You know where I first heard about this exercise, by the way? Because as I told you, I started doing it on the 19th of September, 1999, and this study came out in 2002. I first heard about it on Oprah. Yeah. She talked about a, a gratitude journal. And I, I thought, wow, this is great. Full. And I started doing it. So try, do it. Again, you can't improve happiness or anything in theory. Becoming a merit finder. How do we become merit finders? By re, literally reprogramming, as we'll talk about later today, reprogramming the neural networks. And one of the ways to do it is by doing exercises like this repeatedly, over and over again. William James said that it takes 21 days to create or change a habit. I think it was a little bit optimistic. Very often it takes much longer, especially habits that are deeply ingrained. And that could be a habit of being more of a fault finder. That's a habit. Or low self-esteem. That's a habit. How do I think about myself? Or having negative chatter. That's a habit. These things we can change if we persist with an alternative. And again, more on that when we talk about change. The important thing with this exercise, like anything, we have a tendency to adapt. Right? So if we do it, it becomes mechanized. It becomes routine after a while. How do we prevent that? By being mindful of this exercise. So really thinking, visualizing. So I'm grateful for my parents. I'm actually seeing them, experiencing the emotions that I have when around them. Visualize. Remember, the, the mind doesn't know the difference between the imaginary thing 
and the real thing. So visualize it, imagine it really happening. Take time. It takes me three to five minutes, max, each night. Makes a big difference. One suggestion, actually, that yesterday, the faculty dinner that um, from Ying was, you know, it would be a nice way to start the day by reading the things for which you were grateful for. I think it's a wonderful idea. I actually started doing it this morning. I read it to you. <laughs> every, no, not every time. Um, what this does, it chips away the negativity. And over time, we become more merit finders. Optimism, gratitude becomes a way of life. Now, does that mean that even though I've been doing it consistently for seven years, I don't have negative thoughts? Of course not. Does that mean that everything about me is merit finding and optimistic? Of course not. But it makes a difference. For me, it has made a significant difference. And evidently, through these studies, they have shown consistently with different population, different ages, different cultures, it works. I want to share with you a story about my teacher. My teacher, his name is Ohad Kamin. I will talk about him a few times during the year. Um, he's, he now lives in Israel. That's where we met. But he spent a lot of time when he was younger traveling around Europe. As a 20-year-old, after finishing his military service, he just wanted to get out. And he went, lived in Holland, didn't have any money was homeless for a long time. And at one point, he reached such deep levels of depression. He was homeless. He was living under, literally, was living under a tree. Um, he had no friends there, obviously no, no money, uh, barely, barely could get enough, enough food into his mouth, and didn't have money to return to Israel, was very depressed. And he said intuitively, he took out a piece of paper and a pen, which he had. He, he, he draws and he's also a writer. He had a piece of paper and a pen. He took it out and started to write about the wonderful things in his life. And here are some of the things that he wrote about. One of you mentioned music. He wrote Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. He loves classical music. He wrote Elgar's. Requiem. He wrote ice cream. He wrote family. He wrote friends. He wrote the weather because it wasn't cold then. And he could survive outside. And he wrote all the wonderful things that he was grateful for, for in his life. And he attributes this single activity, or he sees it as a pivotal point, as a turning point in his life. That is what made a big difference to him. He still has that piece of paper. He showed it to me. He's now in his 50s. So that was 30 years ago. He still has that piece of paper, and he keeps it with him. It's all crumbled, but he still keeps it with him. Now the question is, do we need to wait for things to go badly in order to learn to appreciate life? Or can we do it at any moment? Try this exercise. Have a file where you write the wonderful things in your life in general. Do the gratefulness exercise. It makes a difference. And why? Because of this. Do you remember the model we talked about when we discussed Fredrickson? That when we're depressed, when we have negative emotions, we tend to narrow and constrict the fight or flight. And it has an important evolutionary role, right? A lion comes to us. All we focus on is the lion. How do we get out of this situation? So it's important. But it's also maladaptive, because very often when we're feeling down, we're only focusing on the reason why we're feeling down, which makes us feel down and only focus on the reason. And it could be a downward spiral. And here is where gratitude can come in. Gratitude is a positive emotion, arguably the most positive emotion. Feeling it, expressing it, and receiving it. And what that does, it can reverse this downward spiral because in the words of Fredrickson, what positive emotions, gratitude being one of them, and she actually did research on gratitude as well, broadens and builds. And it gets us to think about other things. Not just about the fact that I'm homeless in Holland with no friends and no money and no food, 
but also about the Requiem, but also about the ice cream. And then it broadens and builds, and we're much more likely to act proactively than much more likely to become active agents rather than passive victims. Remember that distinction from the second lecture. We shouldn't just wait for Thanksgiving to express thanks. We live in a given world. What brings fulfillment is gratefulness, the simple response of our heart to this given life in all its fullness. If someone gives you a, I don't know, a summary of a lecture, if someone hands you, oh, brings you a drink from the cooler, you would say thank you, right? We say thank you for these things. And yet we're living in a given world where we have so much and we take it for granted. It's unfair. We're being unfair to the world, whether you believe in God or not, and we're also being unfair to ourselves because we're depriving ourselves of one of the most amazing emotions we're capable of. Galway Kinnell, the poet, to live and die in gratefulness if in no other virtue. It is not just beneficial, it is also moral. And Cicero, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. These thinkers realized the importance of it. And the question is, how can we bring it into our life as a way of life? Not adapt, not get used to the rule, but learn to appreciate day in and day out like a child. One of the most, I mean, the parents here know one of the most amazing things of raising children is to see how they look at life with awe. You know, every time, you know, I, I took my son to daycare this morning, Every time, you know, a bus comes past, bus, bus, bus. Yeah, it's a bus. It's you know, every time I see a bus now, I get excited. <laughs> or <laughs> bus, or doggy, doggy, doggy. I get very excited when I see. You know, you said dogs every day, doggy, doggy. It's wonderful. How can we regain this and maintain it? It's a challenge, but it's possible. Unfortunately, psych positive psychology is looking at exactly that right now. And a good way to start is the gratitude exercise. I want to end this part of the lecture by talking a little bit about the consummate merit finder. Helen Keller, who can help us open our eyes and see the wonder, the awesomeness, the blessings that are all around us. She tells a story of a friend of hers whom she visited who went out for a walk in the woods, not far from here, from where we are now. She was a Radcliffe graduate. So she tells about this friend who went out for a walk in the woods. And when she returned, from the woods, Helen Keller hungrily asked her, so what did you observe? What did you see? To which her friend said, nothing in particular. And Helen Keller writes about that, about that response. I wondered how it was possible to walk for an hour through the woods and see nothing of note. I, who cannot see, find hundreds of things the delicate symmetry of a leaf, the smooth skin of a silver birch, the rough, shaggy bark of a pine. I, who am blind, can give one hint to those who see. Use your eyes as if tomorrow you will have been stricken blind. Hear the music of voices, the songs of a bird, the mighty strains of an orchestra, as if you would be stricken deaf tomorrow. Touch each object as if tomorrow your tactile sense would fail. Smell the perfume of flowers. Taste with relish each morsel, as if tomorrow you could never taste or smell again. Make the most of every sense. Glory in all the facets and pleasures and beauty which the world reveals to you. She who cannot see, she who cannot hear, can open our eyes and can open our ears.
Any questions before I move on? Any comments? Okay. So we've touched a little bit on how we can change. I want to go into depth now to really understand. And this is such a central topic change because, as we've spoken about, a lot of psychologists doubt the ability to change. A lot of individuals doubt their ability to change, to improve, to grow. Let's do a quick recap about the nature of change. And when I talk about change, I mean everything that you want to change, from wanting to be more of a merit finder, wanting to be more optimistic, wanting to increase your self-esteem, wanting to become happier, wanting to change an organization that you're leading, wanting to change, improve a relationship. This applies to change in general. We're going to apply it mostly to positive psychology, but it applies to all forms of change. So a recap. We know that change is hard. We need to accept it as a first step. We know that from various studies. We know it from the twin research. Remember the last line of the twin research that says, trying to change your happiness is as futile as trying to change your height? Do you remember this, this world? Well, it's difficult. That If anything we can take from that study is that it's difficult. Professor Gilbert's work on effective forecasting, how we go back to our base level, or Ed Diener's work that shows that external circumstances matter very little to our levels of happiness. And the Cambridge Somerville study with the underprivileged kids, where the study, the intervention, actually led to the situation worsening. So we know that change is hard, whether it's on the individual level or on the societal level. But we also know that change is possible. How do we know that? Because what many of these studies are doing is they're making the error of the average, saying that most people, on average, don't change their levels of happiness, but there are some who do. Or a study that, again, we spoke about last night at the Cabot faculty dinner, a study on self-esteem and how it doesn't change after the age of seven. Basically, it's, or you're stuck, you're destined to have a certain level of self-esteem. The average, very difficult to change. But there are exceptions, many exceptions, who show that it is possible. And it's the exception that proves the rule. The question is no longer, is it possible to change our self-esteem? Is it possible to become happier? Yes, it is. The question is how. And the question is, how do we take the tip of the stem, the people who have made changes in their lives, or looking at the tip of the stem of our experiences, the best periods in our lives, and what can we learn from these so that we can apply to most people and to most situations? And again, this is what positive psychology is doing, whether it's studying the happiest people, the highest self-esteem people, and saying, what have they done right? that we all can apply to our lives. Because if we have this perception that change is not possible, it can often become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mentioned it. An eight-year-old girl who is depressed and reads the article on the twin studies, how will she come out of it? She will come out of it thinking, I can't change. I'm doomed to be depressed when I'm 88 as well. What hope do I have for a better life? And that can often become a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's useful to look at the self-help or the success literature because it defines so much of the way we think about, about change. Anyone here read Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? <clears throat> Many of you. It's a great book, one of the best self-help books out there. And what he does, he did this research actually here, he was at HBS. He divided 
<clears throat> the success, or he, he looked at the success literature, the self-help literature, over the last 200 years. And what he found was that there is a distinct difference between the success literature over the 200 years until 1930, and then from 1930 until today. Or he did it in 89, until 89. And the difference that he found was the following. Between 1800 and 1930, the literature mainly focused on character change, on virtue change, working on one's values, on working hard, gradual, difficult, hard-earned character change. In 1930, things change. And suddenly we see more and more, instead of the character deep change, the quick fix. The five steps to happiness. The three steps to higher self-esteem. A single step to love. Easy solutions to these difficult questions. The books that initially brought this quick fix idea to the fore, and I'm not bashing these books, they have some very good elements in them, but they also brought this quick fix idea, are Think and Grow Rich by Hill, we talked about it a few lessons ago, a few classes ago, and Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Again, it has some good advice in it, but also has the quick fix approach. The person who epitomizes, to my mind, the era of the character change self-help is Samuel Smiles. What a perfect name, right? I, geez, maybe I should, I should change my name, Tal Positive Psychology. It's great. I mean, he, he, he was primed every day. So what's your name? Samuel Smiles. <laughs> <It's great. laughs> so he was born in 1812, wrote, published his book on self-help in 1859, the same year that Darwin published The Origins of Species, the same year that John Stuart Mill published an essay on liberty. And his book became a bestseller. He wrote about people. He wrote about biographies. That's where I got my, um, my understanding that biographies are the best self-help books from him. I, 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 met, I encountered the book by happenstance. As I was, walking, I was uh, browsing through uh, the Widener Library, and suddenly I see this, you know, they have many old books. I saw one of the first printings of this book, and you know, self-help caught my attention, and I've been reading him since. He's written a lot of books. Wonderful writer. But what he writes about, and the biographies that he talks about, the changes that people experience take time. They're difficult. They go through hardships. And what he says is that if we try to circumvent the hard work of change, we can pay a price. And we can pay a high price. And we are, as a culture, paying a price for the transition from the character change to the quick fix change. Samuel smiles. What we see is that depression today is on the rise. As I mentioned in the second lecture, 10 times, sorry, I can't remember the exact statistics, um, 10 times higher than in the 1960s in terms of, of depression. Yes, some of it is a result of measuring more, but a lot of it is a result of people being more depressed. The, a the average age in 1960 was 29.5 for depression. Today it's 14 and a half. Depression is on the rise and one of the reasons is because we've become a quick fix culture. We're not prepared to struggle anymore and part of it is because of the schema that the self-help books have created. We see a book on the shelf that tells us these are the five steps to happiness. And we see the writer with a huge smile on his or her face promising you that all you need to do is this, these five steps, and you'll be happy. And you buy it, eagerly you read it the same night, and you implement all these things, and initially you feel pumped up and ready for change and changed, but then you go back to your base level. And then what do you think? There must be something wrong with me. There must be something wrong with me because it has worked for so many people. He told me 
or she told me that it works for so many people, but it doesn't work with me. What's wrong? And then we go outside and the great deception is all around us. Everyone is smiling except for me. Then I get the next book. These are the three steps to, to happiness and self-esteem. And it still doesn't work. And I become even more depressed. Not willing to go through the struggles of character change. And it takes time. Samuel smiles. It is not good that human nature should have the road of life made too easy. It is not ease, ease but effort. Not facility, but difficulty that makes men. After reading this book, I came up with the concept of the underprivilege of privilege. The underprivilege of privilege. If things are too easy, that's not good either because it doesn't create character over time. This is why I said one of the th challenges for us as Harvard students and for other people who will probably have a lot of opportunities in the future, who have opportunities right now, is to learn to accept failure. We ha most, most people, I'm not generalizing here to everyone, far from it, but most Harvard students haven't failed enough. And then we become afraid of failure. We become afraid of the struggle. We don't put ourselves out on the line. We avoid difficulties rather than coping with difficulties. Marty Seligman, founder of Positive Psychology, the belief that we can rely on shortcuts to gratification and bypass the exercise of personal strength and virtue is folly. It leads to legions of humanity who are depressed in the middle of great wealth and are starving to death spiritually. And what Marty Seligman does is identify the kind of things that we can work on, that take time, that do demand struggle, in order to change the way we perceive life, in order to be happier. I want to talk, just say a few words about the anatomy of change. What does change look like? Let's look a little bit at the physiology, the biology of change. Until 1998, scientists, and you have an article about this, scientists believe that our mind, our brain, was basically fixed. After the age of three, some thought maybe seven, and hence the self-esteem doesn't change, our brain is fixed. It's a stochastic phenomenon. We were born with it. Early experiences may, be, may determine it, but it doesn't change after that. And that gave proof to the argument that we can't become happier later on in life, that trying to change our happiness is as futile as trying to change our height. That's what they believed until 1998. In 1998, there was breakthrough research through fMRI studies showing the neuroplasticity of our brains, that actually our brain changes until the day we die. One of the experiments that they ran, they took um, new taxi drivers in England. And then uh, when you become a taxi driver in England, you have to memorize the map of London. And it's a lot of work and you're, you're tested on it actually. And they measured the size of the brain before they started to study and after. Their visual cortex actually grew during the months when they were studying for this exam because they had to have a visual of the streets of London. Their brain actually changed and the, these were adults. Other research with musicians playing a piece, practicing a piece, their brain actually changes. The brain structure actually changes over time. And the way it works is that neural pathways that are created, a habit creates a neural pathway, which looks something like this. You see these neural pathways. Some are much thicker, more developed. Others are much thinner. This is a picture of our brain. And these neural pathways function like water channels. In what way? In the way that a water channel initially is created. And then as more water flows through it, it becomes wider or deeper. The same way with our brain. We have neural pathways and we work on something. We create a habit. And initially, it's a very thin neural pathway. 
But as we do it more and more and more, as we cultivate the habit, whether it's the habit of the map or music or hitting a forehand in tennis, as we cultivate this habit, it becomes thicker. And as it becomes thicker, more experiences are likely to flow through it. It's a self-reinforcing process. Can you understand why? It's like a river. As more water flows through it, it becomes bigger. And it becomes bigger, it has capacity to attract more water. And it becomes bigger. This happens for positive neural pathways and for negative neural pathways. And our cha challenge is how do we fortify the part or create initially the positive, thin neural pathway, let's say toward becoming a merit finder, toward becoming more optimistic, a neural pathway to having a higher evaluation of ourselves, self-esteem. How do we fortify these neural pathways while weakening the neural pathways that are disempowering, that cause me to focus on the negative, that cause me to be pessimistic, that cause me to have a negative view of myself. How do we weaken those and fortify the positive neural pathways? And this is what we're going to talk about next week.